Welcome back to part two of the Garnett Spear story. If you haven't already, be sure to check out part one, which I'll have linked in the description. Otherwise, you may be a little lost. All right, let's jump right back in. So we left off with Lacey and Garnett packing up from Florida and moving to the Fellowship, which is located in New York. Like I said in part one, the community is farm focused and quite honestly reminds me of an Amish community. But they do have electricity and things like that. The members do farming and gardening and they have a barn and even horse-drawn carts and they're completely surrounded by woods. The day after she and Garnett arrived, Lacey was introduced to a woman named Una, who was the planner and scheduler for the community. She told Lacey that she was primarily going to be working at Hilltop House, which is the main hub of the community. She would be responsible for cooking, cleaning, and nursing the elderly. Because she lied on her application and said she was a nurse. When she realized that she was going to have to actually work to earn her keep, she took to Facebook to complain about the change, telling her friends that she had made a huge mistake and that she hated it and would love nothing more than to go home. Lacey eventually adjusted to the community though, and she and Garnett settled in. She of course took the opportunity of meeting all of these new people to rehash all of the lies that she had told over the years about Garnett's health and losing Blake. This gained her quite a bit of sympathy from the members of the fellowship, but some some were suspicious from the beginning. Many people noticed that Garnett really didn't seem sick. He was loving his new home and newfound freedom that it brought him. He was allowed to run around the community pretty freely because there were watchful eyes all around. People say that he was lively and full of energy. Some even called Garnett the mayor of the fellowship because he made it a point to get to know everyone that lived there, even at four years old. He tried his best to always remember everyone's name and the people there truly loved him. Lacey befriended a coworker named Valerie who became incredibly close with Garnett. She says that he absolutely loved to play on a tree swing located at the hilltop house. She would play with him almost every single day. It didn't take long before Lacey was back on her bullshit about Garnett's health. After only two days, she brought Garnett to see Dr. Gerald Carnow at the Fellowship's family practice. She claimed that he was having an ear infection and Dr. Carnow referred Garnett to a pediatrician that was located nearby, which Lacey never took him to for the ear infection. Despite that he was suffering from an ear infection, Lacey allowed Garnett to go outside to the greenhouse and to collect chicken eggs from around the farm. He also got to play in the snow, which he was so, so excited about because he had never seen snow before. After about three weeks of being in New York, Lacey and Garnett were put into a ground floor apartment in the North House. There, they had their own bedroom and bathroom, but would be sharing the main living area and kitchen with a single woman named Christine. And this is where trouble at the fellowship started for Lacey. When Lacey and Garnett had moved into the apartment, Christine was on vacation visiting family. Upon her return, she had discovered that someone had gone into her bedroom and took various things such as clothing and toiletries. Obviously, she suspected Lacey. Christine also spotted her comforter and other things in Lacey's bedroom. She was completely furious about the situation and confronted Lacey, at which time Lacey just turned around and walked away. She reported her to the leaders of the fellowship, called the Executive Circle, but was told that she needed to let it go. She then filed a report with the Ramapo Police Department, but dropped it because she was afraid to be dismissed from the fellowship. Lacey acted as if the situation had never even happened. She eventually gave Christine her spiel about Garnett's health and Blake's death, only this time claiming that he had died in the line of duty. Christine was very wary of Lacey and what she said, but her suspicions grew even further after she came home from doing her jobs early. Lacey's bedroom door was left open because she thought that she was alone. When Christine walked in, she saw Lacey leaning over Garnett with a long tube sticking out of him and Lacey was tampering with it. It confirmed her suspicions when Garnett came outside with his head down. He was clearly upset, kicking at the dirt, which was not like Garnett at all. She asked him what was wrong and he told her he didn't feel good because his ear was really hurting. She told him that she hoped he felt better and he responded, I hope you have a good day, Christine. Christine decided to ask about the tube and Lacey told her that he had to be fed through it because he couldn't eat normal food. Having seen him eat normally many times, she said, she hadn't seen him struggling, but that he was complaining about his ears, which Lacey told her not to worry about. 
Throughout the time Lacey and Garnett lived at the Fellowship, they grew increasingly close to Una Younger and her husband Howard. They were a middle-aged couple who had lived at the Fellowship for quite a while. They got to a point that they actually considered Lacey to be like a daughter to them. They spent a lot of time together, and Una eventually took notice that despite Lacey claiming Garnett had trouble eating, she had never witnessed that in all of the time that they had spent together. He ate everything, including things that most kids would never touch, like spicy Chinese dishes. Christine, Lacey's roommate, said the same thing. She challenged Lacey when she claimed that Garnett couldn't swallow food normally because she had seen him eating things like animal crackers and donuts. She also witnessed Lacey's true character many times. Lacey would lose her cool with Garnett and when she thought nobody was looking, she would grab and drag him by his arm. Then, when he would cry and make a scene, she would pick him up and hold and comfort him, so that it looked like she was trying to console him. Another thing that didn't sit right with Christine was that Lacey was not expected to do as much work as the other co-workers. They all worked extremely hard so that they were able to remain a part of the community, but Lacey was able to take off at 1.30 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, other members were working up to 70 hours per week. When Christine brought this up to the executive circle of the fellowship, she was told that she could not interfere and was essentially told to just mind her business. A few weeks later, Christine reported Lacey to the executive circle again because she believed that she was being abusive towards Garnett, particularly during bath time. Christine heard Garnett say, Mommy, that doesn't feel good, during bath time. When he said that, Lacey screamed at him for him to shut up, followed by splashing. Christine told the executives that she feared for Garnett's safety, and they told her that she needed to stop being a troublemaker. Christine eventually reached her breaking point with the situation and could no longer stand to watch Lacey's abuse to continue, which resulted in her leaving the fellowship. I want to jump forward a little bit to February of 2013, when Chris Hill, Garnett's real dad, tried to reach out to Lacey on Facebook after Shauna had sent him pictures of his son. He messaged her that he wanted to say hi and check in on them. He also made sure that she knew he wasn't going to do anything stupid, and that he had been periodically checking in on them over the years. He told her that he didn't want to reach out because he knew she wouldn't talk to him. When he received no response, he followed up and asked her not to block him because he knew how she was, and that he wasn't going to bother her, he just wanted to check in on Garnett. She still never responded, but had plenty of time to tell everyone on Facebook that she had plans to adopt a baby with Down syndrome. Her baby fever was picking back up, and she soon explained to Una that she considered just going out to a bar to pick up a man for sex so that he could get her pregnant. Una really didn't think Lacey should go do that, so strangely, she offered to allow Lacey to sleep with Howard, her husband, so that she could get pregnant with his child. While Una and Howard admit that they offered, they deny that he and Lacey were ever intimate. That didn't stop rumors from swirling around the fellowship, though, after Lacey was seen sitting in Howard's lap in public. So you decide what you think is happening. In March of that year, Lacey finally took Garnett to the pediatrician that she had been referred to four months earlier named Dr. Zatz. He got Garnett's medical history from Lacey before conducting a physical examination. He was average height and weight for a child his age, and all of his blood work came back normal. He then referred her to another ear, nose, and throat specialist, a pediatric gastroenterologist, as well as a dentist due to the state of Garnett's teeth from the lack of fluoride treatments. Lacey set up the appointment with Dr. Derenkov, who was the gastroenterologist. She told him that Garnett had been diagnosed with celiac disease and Crohn's disease. He then told her that they needed to conduct a feeding evaluation so that they could determine how much Garnett was able to eat by mouth and how much he needed to rely on the G-tube. Lacey ignored this request on this visit and many more after that. At one appointment, after he had requested the feeding evaluation several times, Dr. Derenkov wrote Lacey prescriptions for Garnett net for an IV pole with a kangaroo pump feeding device, a Mickey button, as well as feeding bags and syringes, despite ignoring his many requests for Garnett to be evaluated. He did eventually perform an endoscopy on Garnett though, which determined that he did not have celiac or Crohn's disease, and again told her she needed to have a feeding evaluation done, which she still did not do. I just want to point out the fact that she refused to have the feeding evaluation done, which was not invasive at all, but agreed to have the endoscopy done, which was extremely invasive. They literally sent a camera inside his intestines, and she agreed to that no problem but wouldn't do the feeding evaluation. A little fucked up if you ask me. 
In April, Lacey and Garnett moved into their own one-bedroom apartment that was located in the basement of the Tulip House, which was located in the woods of the Fellowship community. In the same month, a middle-aged couple named Charisse and Shia moved into the apartment above Lacey. Charisse and Lacey quickly became friendly, and Lacey expressed to her on many occasions that she wanted to have another baby, despite all of Garnett's health issues. Charisse was completely shocked and offended when Lacey asked her if her husband Shia, who was almost 60 years old by the way, could father a child for her after only knowing them for a few weeks. They told her no and maintained their distance from her after that. The following month, Lacey claimed that she was being sexually harassed by various men who lived in the fellowship, and the Ramapo police were called in to investigate. The man obviously denied that this happened and was told to avoid Lacey by the executive circle. Nothing was done to either party. Christine, who had heard from friends at the fellowship that this was happening, was enraged that once again, the executive circle sided with Lacey. It seemed as if the woman could do no wrong, and Christine didn't get why they couldn't see how evil she was. That wouldn't be the last harassment claim that Lacey would make. She accused another man of the same thing, and he and his wife were told to leave the community, their home, without even being given the opportunity to defend themselves. Okay, jumping forward a little bit, in August, Lacey told everyone that she and Garnett were going to be going raw for that month and hopefully forever, meaning that they were only going to be eating raw vegetables and would be going vegan. Someone asked her why he would not be allowed to have peanut butter, to which Lacey responded, quote, He's never had peanut butter, has very little to no nutritional value, even the organic stuff. That being said, I have always made a nut butter for him. Cashew, almond, sunflower seed. Peanuts also harbor mold, enough to turn anyone off. I also soak and dehydrate my nuts. She's had many stomach and intestinal problems, so by soaking them, it makes it easier on G, and your body can gain nutrients from the nuts. Nuts that haven't been soaked and dehydrated give little nutrients off. Body can't break them down. Jelly? Well, jelly is sugar. We don't do sugar. He's never had jelly. Doesn't have a taste for jelly. So why give it to him now? Store-bought or processed jellies have nothing to gain from by eating. Yes, we do honey. He asked for cashew butter with honey on homemade bread. Bread made from almond. We also don't eat grains. Sometimes I wish I didn't know the horrible impact food has on your body, the environment, and the future generations. We only eat organic. I make 90% of our food, even milk. I'm a raw, grainless vegan, and G's a grainless vegan. When he's older and can truly understand the importance of food, I'll let him decide what he wants to eat. I don't deny him food. We meet on a middle ground. Meanwhile, Garnett was preparing to start half days at the Waldorf School. His teacher, Carol Greeter, actually came to visit Lacey and Garnett at their home to introduce herself. While she was there, Lacey droned on about Garnett's strict diet needs, giving her a long list of foods that he wasn't allowed to eat. He couldn't have anything that had gluten in it, but there were many other forbidden foods as well. Lacey told her that she intended to bring him specially prepared lunches every day. She and Garnett both seemed excited for him to attend the school until the week before school was to start. Lacey called Carol and told her that she didn't think Garnett should go to school, but then apparently changed her mind later because he started on September 13th, 2013. The school was extremely understanding in regards to Garnett's health and allowed him to start gradually. First, he would go to the playground to be associated with the other kids. Eventually, he started going two days a week, then moved to four days a week. He absolutely loved it. He loved his classmates and the activities that they got to do. Despite their plans to slowly ease him into the change, Lacey claimed that Garnett wanted to go every day and allowed him to start attending five days a week. Every morning, he was ecstatic to be there and would actually stand at the gate waiting for all of his classmates and teachers at the school. He remembered all of their names and made it a point to talk to everybody. Lacey befriended another mother named Nellie at Garnett's school soon after. Like with every Everyone, Lacey told her all about her fabricated life, but it raised a red flag when Lacey told her that Garnett had a cochlear implant because Nellie knew for a fact that you could see those devices when implanted. I'm not a doctor, but from what I understand, they essentially help someone with extreme hearing loss to be able to hear and process sounds. When Nellie questioned why she couldn't see this device, without missing a beat, Lacey told her that they had implemented new technology 
thing that allowed them to put it inside his ear. Nelly later Googled it and couldn't find any technology like that. So clearly she was lying. She also thought it was weird that Lacey was saying he was so sickly while he acted completely normal. Once again, the feeding issues didn't seem real, and Garnett ate anything that she fed to her children, including pizza and various snacks that she put out for the kids. When she questioned Lacey about it, she said she only used the G-tube for supplemental feedings. Garnett's teacher, who actually used to be a nurse, also took notes of this as well. Lacey sent the special gluten-free food with him every day. He would eat everything and still want seconds or thirds, to the point that she had to ask Lacey to send more food for him, because he couldn't have what everyone else was having. She notes that his energy level was good and he was able to participate in everything. He was generally happy, but Carol was startled when Garnett started saying, Daddy died! Daddy died! while he was happily playing with his classmates. Not typical behavior. In October, Lacey posted on her social media that she had finally given up breastfeeding when Garnett was nearly five years old. She claimed to have nursed him until he was 55 months old. And I just want to point out that no one once ever witnessed her breastfeeding, ever. Garnett returned to Dr. Darren Cove's office for a routine appointment and was happy to hear that Garnett was eating more food by mouth. He told her that he didn't feel Garnett needed the G-tube any longer and that it was absolutely necessary that they do a nutritional evaluation. Lacey agreed, but never followed up. The following month, Lacey and Garnett flew to Clearwater to celebrate Christmas with their family. Two days after Christmas, while still in Florida, both Nellie and Carol received emails from Lacey claiming that Garnett was in the pediatric intensive care unit because he was having seizures, vomiting, and had a fever of 104. She later claimed that Garnett had an intestinal virus and had just been diagnosed with Crohn's disease and a milk allergy, which had made his fever spike to 105 degrees. None of this was true true. In fact, Garnett spent his Christmas vacation on the beach, eating at Frenchie's and going to see Christmas lights every night. They flew back to New York as planned, and Garnett returned to school on January 7th, 2014. Carol noted that Garnett was acting normal and he was very happy to be back. The following Friday, Lacey kept him home from school, telling everyone that he had a fever and a stomach bug. She wrote on Facebook that Garnett was really struggling and then took him to see Dr. Carnell, the family doctor at the fellowship. She said that he was having issues in school and couldn't focus or concentrate. Allegedly, he wasn't sleeping and was again struggling with food. So she was forced to feed him through the tube. She then claimed that Garnett disliked school and was, quote, playing with things of death, whatever that means. When Dr. Carnell examined Garnett, he didn't find anything wrong with him, though he prescribed him with three homeopathic remedies for behavioral issues. Lacey emailed Carol and told her that Garnett couldn't return to school because he had a stomach virus and a fever of 104. She then told others that he had relapsed and wasn't eating anything by mouth, suffering from extreme diarrhea, etc. Though only a couple days later, she posted photos of Garnett on Facebook eating Chinese food and happily painting a picture at the kitchen table. I find it a little ironic that for Garnett having so many eating issues and refusing to eat anything by mouth, it's crazy to me that he would willingly eat Chinese food at six years old. My 10 year old daughter won't even try a bite, but Garnett, who had to be fed through a G-tube, had no issue with it. Anyway, Lacey emailed his teacher that night and told her that he was still maintaining 102 to 104 degree temperature. She said he was getting fluids and she was keeping him hydrated, but he was still sick to the stomach and she was going to take him to the doctor tomorrow to have his sodium levels checked because the smallest change to his sodium levels could cause him to have seizures. And detectives think this is when Lacey started to plot Garnett's death. The same night, Lacey conducted three Google searches on her iPhone. The first was to look up the real Blake. The second was to look up how many days had passed since October 6, 2011, because that's when fake Blake died. And the last came several hours later. She Googled the words normal sodium levels for a child. She then clicked on one of the results, which was for an online medical encyclopedia, where she viewed the ratio of sodium to blood. 
That morning, she took Garnett to Dr. Zatt's office and told him that Garnett had been running a 105 degree temperature for the previous five days. But when Dr. Zatz took his temperature for himself, it was a perfect 98.6. He then examined Garnett and determined that there was nothing wrong, but that Garnett could have had a virus that had already passed. At 8.17 p.m., Lacey conducted another Google search about the effects of elevated sodium in children. For the next 40 minutes, she made eight other searches, such as dangers of high sodium levels in a child, and what happens to someone if they have high high sodium levels in the blood, as well as the word hypernatremia, which was what Garnett had as a baby. The following night, she took Garnett to the Good Samaritan Hospital emergency room, claiming that Garnett had suffered from two seizures and that he had one just now while they were waiting. She said he had a headache and explosive diarrhea. Lacey claimed that Garnett had been dry heaving and grabbing his head, and his eyes had rolled back and he was unresponsive for a few seconds. She said that he had seizures in the past due to hypernatremia, aka the high sodium level. Dr. Ellerman, who was on call, examined Garnett and noticed that everything seemed fine outside of his G-tube. He answered her questions and cooperated until she asked him to stand up and walk to her. Garnett repeatedly told her no. She then asked Lacey to walk down the hallway and call her son to her. When she did so, Garnett still refused, which was strange. They conducted a CAT scan, x-rays of his chest, and ran blood work and everything came back normal aside from Garnett's sodium level. It was slightly elevated at 147. The doctor told Lacey that his chloride levels were also slightly elevated, but neither was anything they would need to treat. They couldn't rule out the seizures, but everything appeared normal. They offered to have Garnett transferred to the Westchester Medical Center to be seen by a pediatric neurologist in the ICU, but Lacey declined, stating that she would just take him to the pediatrician in the morning. Garnett was then discharged after about five hours. Lacey later told everyone in the fellowship community and online that the hospital didn't take Garnett's seizures seriously and claimed that he had two additional seizures. The following day, she claimed that Garnett's condition had worsened. She also lied and told people that his sodium levels were 189, when they were actually 147. A nurse that Lacey was friends with on Facebook knew that those levels were life-threatening and that Garnett should be in the hospital. Lacey claimed he was continuing to have seizures, a total of six, and that she was taking him again. She took him to see Dr. Zatz the next day, claiming that Garnett had suffered from five seizures. After an examination, the doctor couldn't find any anything wrong with Garnett, but referred him to see a pediatric neurologist just to be safe. Garnett's teacher went to visit him at Tulip House. When she walked in, she saw Lacey holding Garnett on the couch and he was whimpering. She took note of the IV pole with this kangaroo pump and a feeding bag full of liquid that looked like milk. She said it appeared that he was suffering from a severe headache. Lacey told her that he had been happy and playing early in the day, but then he had suddenly taken a turn for the worse. Carol told Lacey that Garnett needed to go to the ER and offered to give them a ride, but Lacey declined. Carol left, and Lacey then fed Garnett through his G-tube and called Una a short time later in a panic. When Una answered the call, Lacey was screaming that Garnett was having seizures and that she needed to use her car immediately so that she could take him to the hospital. Una rushed over and she and Lacey headed over to Hilltop House. There, they ran into another friend, Valerie, and Lacey told her that they were on the way to Nyack Hospital emergency room. Garnett asked Valerie if she would come and get him later. She didn't think much of it at the time, but now wonders if that was Garnett asking her for help, which just breaks your heart. Lacey was so concerned that she decided to stop on the side of the road on the way to the hospital, got out of the car, and started snapping photos of her son while he was whimpering in pain. They arrived at the hospital at approximately 3 p.m. and while they waited, Lacey was steadily texting friends spewing lies. She claimed that Garnett had a seizure that lasted for five full minutes. She followed up by asking her friend, quote, what if he dies? I'm so scared. Shortly after, a nurse came in and noticed that Garnett's hands were trembling. She took his blood pressure and temperature, which were normal. Lacey told her that he had suffered from three seizures and that his eyes had been rolling in the back of his head. She then told her that Garnett had been seen at Good Samaritan Hospital because he had suffered from four other seizures before giving the nurse the long version of Garnett's medical history. Lacey claimed that Garnett was allergic to dairy, had an esophageal stretching, 
thing, tonsils and adenoids removed, multiple ear surgeries, a Neeson fund application, and the G-tube placement, as well as celiac disease and Crohn's disease, and that he was unvaccinated because they were Mormon and they didn't believe in them. The nurse then briefed Dr. McSherry. When he came in to examine Garnett, Lacey once again recited all of Garnett's medical issues, and then threw in that he had been hospitalized as an infant due to high sodium levels. She claimed that his sodium level was around 200, which obviously shocked the doctor because that's a deadly level. While the doctor was in the room, he did observe Garnett trying to vomit multiple times, but he was unable to due to the operation that he had had. The doctor found no evidence that Garnett had any seizures. Either way, Garnett was admitted to Nyack Hospital for observation. Dr. McSherry then reached out to Garnett's multiple doctors and they all determined that it would be best that they perform a video EEG to find out more about the seizures. Dr. McSherry then reported to the hospital's pediatrician, Dr. Sunku, that he didn't believe that Garnett was actually having seizures and that he thought Lacey may be suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy. When she went in to visit Garnett, he had improved and he was happy to speak with her. Dr. Sunku and Lacey spoke briefly about Garnett's G2 and his special diet and Lacey mentioned that at one point Garnett had sodium levels that reached 200, which the doctor didn't believe because that would have caused brain damage or death. Once Garnett was admitted, a video EEG was placed in his room to monitor for seizure activity, which Lacey signed off on. There were electrodes connected to his scalp to record his brain waves, as well as a video camera that was positioned in front of him so that they could monitor what was happening on the outside versus the inside. Dr. Sunku then ordered blood work to be done so that they could check his sodium and chloride levels. As soon as she had the opportunity to, Lacey posted the news on Facebook and kept everyone updated through the rest of the time they were there. When his lab results came back, Garnett's sodium level was 138 and his chloride was 105, both of which were normal. Around 7 p.m. that night, Lacey asked Una to come and sit with Garnett so that she could go home and get some things. Una was still working, so Howard sat with him for a while. Garnett was in good spirits and was acting normal throughout the night. In fact, he was extremely excited that there was a TV in his room because he desperately wanted to watch it since they didn't have one at home. The EEG was finally set up in front of Garnett's bed. The machine was actually supposed to have both audio and video capability, but was unfortunately set up incorrectly so only the video was working properly. Over the next day or so, Garnett seemed to be doing well. He was in good spirits according to everyone around him. Every nurse and doctor that came in and out of his room noted that they saw no issues with him. Nellie brought Lacey some food to the hospital and noted that Garnett was bursting with energy. She believed he would be released the following day because he was doing so well. On Sunday morning at 9.08 a.m., Lacey conducted several Google searches and they read as follows. What is iodized salt? Why buy iodized salt? More than iodized salt, what's in it? Central nervous system, benign and malignant brain tumors, and abnormal brain activity. That morning, Dr. Sunku came in and examined Garnett again and informed Lacey that everything appeared normal and they were going to conduct an MRI the following morning. If everything came back normal, Garnett would be able to go home. She claims that Lacey had no reaction to this news. Within an hour of hearing the news, Lacey got up and took Garnett into the bathroom, which is documented in the video from the EEG machine. He can be seen acting completely normal, even grabbing and eating a cookie on the way to the bathroom. Lacey left him in the bathroom while she came out and got something out of her bag, which was out of the camera's range. Less than a minute later, she reappeared on camera and was holding Garnett's connector tube and a large cup. She headed back to the bathroom and was in there with Garnett for about three minutes. Again, out of the camera's view. When they came out of the bathroom, Garnett's demeanor had completely changed. Lacey picked him up and put him back in the bed, while Garnett looked terrified and looked like his energy had been completely depleted. He can be seen rubbing his nose, which can actually be a side effect when someone is having an allergic reaction to salt. Garnett had a look across his face like he knew what was coming. And that's when Lacey picked him up and carried him back into the bathroom. When they exited again, she had the connector tube and a cup. She put him back in his bed and double checked that his Mickey button was closed. Lacey can be seen watching Garnett with a great intensity. She picked up the call button and put it
put it up on the bed as if she were preparing to use it. After a few minutes, Garnett started trying to throw up, which again was impossible. At 10.35 a.m., Lacey pressed the call button and his nurse rushed in. Garnett was dry heaving, rolling around in his bed, screaming in agony as he held his head. When Dr. Sunku came in, she noticed that Garnett was asking for water repeatedly, which she thought was strange because most people don't ask for anything while trying to vomit. The doctor prescribed pain medications, as well as something to help with his nausea and pushed fluids through his IV. About an hour later, Garnett began having explosive diarrhea because that was the only way he could rid his system of whatever was in it. Throughout the day, Garnett's body was shaking and shivering. Dr. Sunku decided to check his glucose level, which was high at 240. She then ordered more lab work to measure his sodium, chloride, and potassium levels to make sure everything was functioning the way it was supposed to. The lab work came back within a few hours and his sodium level was at 144, which was normal. His chloride was a little high at 114, but he had improved significantly. When the nurse came in to check on him, Lacey was very interested to know what his sodium level was at. She was told it was normal and that was that. Garnett was doing much better and was drinking a ton of water. Almost two hours after the lab results came back, Lacey can be seen taking Garnett back into the bathroom with the cup and connector in her hands again. When they came back out, Garnett had his head down. She put him back into his bed and he looked out of it. Strangely, right after they emerged from the bathroom, Lacey changed his diaper. She also picked him up roughly by his wrist to readjust him. And then she sat down and waited. Ten minutes later, she pressed the call button again, and Garnett's nurse rushed in yet again to find him dry heaving. Dr. Sunku came in and prescribed another dose of medication for nausea, and that's when the nurse noticed that Garnett's Mickey button was open, as if someone had just administered something to him. Despite having another dose of anti-nausea medicine, as well as pain reliever, Garnett was in severe pain. He was crying real tears while rolling around in his bed because he was in so much pain. About an hour later, Lacey began screaming so loudly that she could be heard down the hall. When his nurse rushed in, she realized that Garnett was having a seizure. Dr. Sunku then rushed in and immediately prescribed a very strong anti-seizure medication. When that didn't help, they were forced to give him a second dose, which stopped his seizures for a few minutes before they started again. He was then given two more doses of the medication, so four total, which helped for a few minutes before they would start again. She then had to prescribe him with two doses of an even stronger anti-seizure medication. After that, Garnett started struggling to breathe due to his oxygen levels dropping dramatically. He was then intubated and put on life support. And at that point, Dr. Sunku knew she had to have him transported to another hospital that was more equipped to care for him. She started making preparations to transport to Westchester Medical Center, which had a pediatric intensive care unit. They were concerned because they couldn't get his seizures to stop and Garnett was no longer able to breathe on his own. And shockingly, while all this was going on, Lacey was on her phone texting her friends that Garnett wasn't doing well. I'm sorry, but what the actual f***? What parent would be concerned about being on their phone, updating other people while their child is having seizures and laying in the bed dying? I would be inconsolable, and I know every other parent out there would be as well. That's just crazy to me. Anyway, about 30 minutes after all this occurred, another doctor checked Garnett's EEG activity to see if they could see seizure activities. She unexpectedly found that his brain waves were slowing, which is far worse than seeing seizure activity would be. Lacey's friend Nellie rushed to the hospital before Garnett was transported, and when she walked in, she saw that Garnett was having a seizure and was throwing himself all over the bed. The hospital sedated Garnett so that he could be intubated, at which time Nellie hugged Lacey to provide her some comfort. When she did this, Lacey coldly told her that she needed to go out in the hallway to call Grandma Peggy. She seemingly didn't care that Garnett was having seizures or about what was going on and seemed completely distracted. Nellie then did her best to comfort Garnett, stroking his head and telling him that he was going to be okay because she knew Lacey wasn't going to do it. 20 minutes later, Lacey came back from speaking with her grandma and asked the nurse to check Garnett's labs because his sodium level was high the last time this happened. They did decide to run his labs once more and put a rush on the results. They came back within 30 minutes and Dr. Sunku was absolutely shocked and horrified because Garnett's sodium levels had went from 144 to 182 in four hours, while his chloride had risen from 114 to 160, both of which was medically impossible according to doctors. Lacey continued to ask for the results, anxiously waiting to find out what his
his levels were at. When Dr. Sunku went in to discuss the results with Lacey, she was calm and told her that she had, quote, been expecting this, and smiled as she said it. She must have been really proud of herself that she knew more than the doctors. A nurse at Nyack Hospital called Dr. Carrie Goltzman, who was the director of the PQ at Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital, which was located in Westchester Medical Center. She informed him that Garnett's sodium level was at 182, and when she said this, he told her that they needed to run it again because it had to be a mistake. He was in complete and utter disbelief. When they ran his blood again, his sodium levels had dropped a bit to 178 and his chloride was at 155. They were both dangerously high and that proved that the previous numbers were no mistake. The hospital told Lacey that they were going to airlift Garnett to the Westchester Medical Center. She asked if he was dying before refusing to ride in the helicopter with him because she was scared. She did fly with him in the end, but only after being persuaded by friends that were there. They had to delay his transport due to a snowstorm, so nurses were able to observe Lacey on the phone in the hallway as Garnett laid by himself on life support in critical condition. People also noticed her quote lack of emotion and many staff members noticed that friends were more upset than Lacey was. Garnett was transferred to Maria Ferreri around 9 30 that night while Lacey was busy updating all of her Facebook friends about his condition. Una arrived at the hospital around the same time and once she found Lacey she asked her how she was holding up and Lacey once again smiled. Dr. Goldsman came in and examined Garnett and ran his blood work yet again. The results came back and Garnett's sodium level was still at 178 while his chloride came down slightly to 147. Either way, both were still dangerously high. He also took note of Garnett's G-tube, which instantly made him suspicious. The doctor wasn't aware of the G-tube previously and couldn't understand how his sodium level had risen so high so quickly. When he saw the G-tube, the pieces started coming together. He instantly thought that Garnett had been given sodium through the tube, and that was the reasoning because it was the only thing that made sense. Dr. Goldsman then had Lacey, Una, and Nellie come into his office. Lacey was calm and recited a long list of medical issues that Garnett had suffered from. He asked her what happened that day, and it's almost like it was rehearsed. She recited it back to him, no issues, like she was prepared to be asked that question, and then mentioned that Garnett had drank over a hundred ounces of water. He didn't believe her because had Garnett drank that much, it would have been equivalent to six or seven bottles of water, which is a lot for a small child. Not only that, Garnett would have been able to pee off most of the excess sodium in his system. She told him that it had been well over a week since she had last given him anything in his G-tube. When Lacey told the doctor that, Una was shocked because she had seen Lacey feeding Garnett through his G-tube only two days beforehand. After listening to Lacey lie to the doctor for a few minutes, Una decided to speak up and tell the doctor the truth because she thought that it would help Garnett. When she did so, Lacey gave her a dirty look that upset her so much that she had to leave and sit in the waiting room. Once they were done speaking with Dr. Goldsman, Nellie and Lacey went into an empty hospital room and Nellie told her she needed to start being honest with the doctor. Lacey became angry, stating that she felt the doctor was accusing her of something. Dr. Goldsman diagnosed Garnett with hypernatremia and came up with an action plan to lower his sodium over the next two days. The plan included IV fluids, dextrose and potassium, and to be taken off the sedative so that he could wake up and be taken off of life support. He then ordered an NPO, which means that Garnett couldn't have anything by mouth. They wanted to closely monitor and control anything going Going into Garnett's body. Dr. Goldsman then told Lacey she was not to give him anything, not even a sip of water, or it could kill him. As I said earlier, Lacey was documenting all of this on social media, and people took notice when she posted continuous selfies of her smiling while her son was so close to death. Dr. Goldsman checked on Garnett prior to ending his shift. He was still intubated, but his sodium levels were lowering the way that they hoped they would. By 7.30 a.m., Garnett's sodium was at 172, which is still high, but was coming down the way that it should have been, and it continued to drop all throughout the morning. Thankfully, Garnett was starting to wake up. He was responsive and was able to shake his head and answer questions that the nurses and doctors were asking him. He was finally able to breathe on his own, and they were able to remove the tube that was helping him breathe. When they told Lacey that, it should have been good news, but she didn't want them to remove the two because she thought Garnett would be uncomfortable. Dr. Pinto, the doctor that took over for Dr. Goldsman, explained to her that if they kept the tube in, he could get an infection or the tube could get dislodged. Lacey still objected, but they removed the tube anyway. Garnett became more and more aware of his surroundings and kept saying that he wanted to go home. He was alert, according to doctors, and was able to follow their commands and was asking for water. 
Once Nellie felt that Garnett was going to be okay, she told him that she was going to go home because she needed to get back to her own kids. He said, quote, don't go, I want you to stay. At the time, Nellie thought it was sweet, but it's likely he was afraid to be alone with his own mother. While all this was happening, friends in Alabama felt so sorry for what was happening to Garnett that they created a PayPal account to help raise money for his expenses. A church got involved and donated $500 into her bank account. They were able to raise another $800 for her over the next week. She was also telling everyone that Blake's family was there with her at the hospital. While Garnett's condition was improving, Lacey continued to make dramatic posts, acting as if it wasn't improving. His labs ran again and his sodium level was down to 161, while his chloride was at 131. Again, still high, but significantly better. Dr. Pinto came in and checked on Garnett. He was doing okay and was asking for drinks of water. The doctor allowed him to take a couple of sips just to wet his mouth. Overall, things were looking much better, but of course, Lacey told a different story on Facebook. Garnett actually had a quiet night, while Lacey reported that it was actually the opposite. When Dr. Goldsman returned for his shift, Garnett's most recent labs showed that his sodium levels had dropped to 146 and his chloride was down to 114, both of which were almost back to normal. About an hour later, Lacey told Nellie that the nasty doctors were there that day. Shortly after, the emergency bell for Garnett's room went off, and Dr. Goldsman literally ran into his room. He saw Lacey leaning over Garnett, and he immediately noticed an empty bottle of water underneath the bed. He yelled at the nurse to take the bottle because he had been suspicious of her already. He thought that Lacey had given Garnett water by mouth, which could cause brain damage. They told Lacey that she needed to leave the room. Meanwhile, Garnett had stopped breathing, and his eyes became unresponsive to light. Dr. Pinto also rushed in and intubated Garnett because he was unable to breathe on his own. Dr. Goldsman ordered another CAT scan and new blood work, and shockingly, while they were working on Garnett, Lacey was out in the hallway making phone calls. The brain scan showed that Garnett Spears was brain dead. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details about this, but basically the sodium in his body had caused fluid to go into his brain. It caused swelling and his brain started herniating. Nellie arrived to find Garnett on life support once again. When she got there, Lacey complained that the doctors were suspicious of her and that they had taken a bottle of water out of the room. Shortly after, Lacey's parents arrived, who had spent two days driving there from Kentucky. Lacey asked Nellie not to tell her parents that the hospital was suspicious about her, and she didn't want anyone to say anything about her lifestyle or Garnett's health while her mother was around. Dr. Goldsman went in and discussed the CAT scan with Lacey and her parents. He explained everything to them and told them that it was likely Garnett was brain dead and that it was likely he wouldn't survive. Lacey, of course, made a huge scene, running out of the room, down the hallway, screaming and crying. She then fell to the floor where she would lay for the next hour and a half, yelling, my baby, my baby. When Tina finally could no longer take Lacey's screams, she left Garnett's side and came into the hallway to talk some sense into her daughter. Tina sternly told her that she needed to get it together because it wasn't about her. It was about Garnett, and she needed to be there for him in his final moments. And Lacey actually obliged. She composed herself almost immediately. Because these alleged crimes took place in two different counties, the Westchester police contacted the Ramapo PD, which is where Lacey and Garnett lived, and the two departments began working Garnett's case together. The Ramapo PD immediately contacted CPS in their county, and together they headed directly to the fellowship community so that they could investigate the situation further. While on their way, they started working on having a warrant signed so that they could search Lacey and Garnett's apartment for medications and literal salt. When they were finally able to enter Lacey's apartment, they first noticed Garnett's feeding machine, which still had a feeding bag attached to it that was full of white liquid. They were aware by that point that Garnett had a G-tube, so it wasn't particularly out of the ordinary for the detectives. As they searched the rest of the apartment, they were quite surprised about the state of Lacey and Garnett's bedroom. 
The entire apartment, even down to the closet, was extremely organized. But when you stepped into the bedroom, it was like they were stepping into someone else's life. It was untidy, there was only one mattress on the floor, which was unmade, and the rest of the room was very disorganized, which obviously didn't reflect the state of the rest of the apartment. Detectives were even more shocked by Lacey's kitchen. Not because it was untidy, but because Lacey had built what appeared to be some type of shrine. There was a photo of Garnett surrounded by multiple candles. In the middle of that sat some of his medications, as well as a large container of salt. As much as I feel that Lacey is suspicious, the photo of Garnett with the candles seems more like intentional home decor rather than a shrine. However, what makes it disturbing is a container of salt sitting with it given the circumstances. If you walked into someone else's kitchen and saw this scene, you probably wouldn't think much of it. But when you have more context and insight into the situation, it's definitely pretty eerie, in my opinion. They searched the garbage and found another feeding bag which had traces of white liquid in it, the same as the one that was still hanging. They discussed collecting the feeding bags, however, ultimately made the decision to photograph the bags and didn't actually take them into evidence at that time. They did, however, seize over 170 different medications that she had admitted administered to Garnett over the years, most of them being holistic medications. In addition, they seized two large containers of salt and a syringe that was found on the couch. While searches were being done by the Ramapo Police Department, the Westchester PD were at the hospital with Lacey and her entire family. They soon began conducting interviews with them and were once again surprised by Lacey's behavior. To the detectives, it was strange that Lacey seemed very eager to talk to them and actually enjoyed discussing Garnett's long list of medical issues with them. Them. They took note that she was very educated and knew medical terminology well. She told them her entire fabricated life story, all about Blake's death and so on, with no emotion. Seems like a good thing to lie to the police during a death investigation. She acted as if she had no problem being there, discussing her life and her son with detectives, and was in no hurry to get back to her family or her dying son. There were a few times that Lacey appeared like she was crying and she could quickly shake off the emotions when she was asked another question. They eventually conducted interviews with everyone else who was there, who also agreed that Lacey's lack of emotion and bizarre actions were alarming. Nellie told detectives that while she was in the room with Lacey and Garnett, she appeared to be crying and upset, but as soon as her phone rang, she answered, Hello? as if she didn't have a care in the world. Many people, including detectives, noticed how much Lacey was coming and going out of Garnett's room and how much time she was spending sending text messages, taking phone calls, and updating her Facebook status. It didn't bother her to come and go from Garnett's room, and it seemed like she didn't care to spend the last hours Garnett had with Garnett. People were also noticing that Tina, Lacey's mom, didn't leave Garnett's side basically the entire time, and she was very cold towards Lacey. That suggested to them that maybe Tina thought Lacey knew more than she was letting on, and that Tina thought it was Lacey that caused harm to Garnett. I want to backtrack a little bit to when the doctors conducted the first EEG on Garnett. Right after receiving the news that he was likely not going to recover, Lacey reached out to a friend at the fellowship named Valerie. They briefly spoke, and Valerie did what anyone does in this type of situation. She told her, please let me know if you need anything. Lacey didn't write in that moment, but a few hours later she contacted Valerie once again and asked her if she would go back to her apartment and get a feeding bag that she had left there before Garnett was hospitalized. That in itself isn't that weird, I guess, but most people wouldn't be concerned with something like that when their child's dying. Lacey then asked her to take the bag out of her apartment and throw it away without telling anybody. Valerie agreed, but enlisted the help of another friend at the fellowship. She felt that it was odd, and she didn't want to go to the apartment alone. Once they arrived, they actually had to knock on the door of the tulip house, which is where Lacey's apartment was located, because they didn't have a way inside. The upstairs neighbor told them that he advised against that, because the police had been there and had taken photos of everything in her apartment. They went downstairs to get the bag anyway, and the neighbor followed. He tried to warn her again that he didn't think she should be taking the bag. 
However, Valerie was just determined to help her friend. They removed the feeding bag and placed it into a black trash bag, and the women left. Valerie then took the feeding bag back to her apartment, but she felt like something was off. It was such a bizarre favor to ask, and now that she knew that the police had been there earlier in the day, she decided not to throw the bag away. She then headed to work, but the more that she thought about the situation and what she had just done, the more uncomfortable she was about what had just transpired. She then decided to go and speak with the fellowship director of nursing and tell her what had happened. The nurse then reported to Bob, who was a member of the executive circle, and was actually in a meeting with detectives at that time. He didn't say anything to the police at that point, but Bob told the nurse to ask Valerie to type out a written statement about what had happened. The nurse then went to Valerie's apartment, got her statement and the feeding bag, and took it back to their medical office. She then placed it in a brown box and completely sealed it. Bob then contacted the Ramapo Police Department and told them that they had the feeding bag in their possession and that Lacey had asked Valerie to throw it away. They rushed over there to pick up the evidence, which they had purposely left behind in the first place. They then interviewed Valerie, who told them exactly what happened. By this point, Lacey was on her third interview with detectives, and the entire Spears family, as well as numerous friends from the fellowship, had all been interviewed. And Lacey's lies were starting to be exposed. When they spoke with Terry, Lacey's dad, both detectives and Terry were shocked to discover that Lacey had fabricated so much of her life story. Terry told them he didn't know who Blake was and that Garnett's biological father was a man who lived in Alabama named Chris. As the lies started unfolding and Lacey was growing more and more paranoid that people were suspicious of her, she decided to hire an attorney by the name of David Sachs. Meanwhile, Garnett underwent the second EEG and was declared brain dead at 10.20 a.m. on January 23rd, 2014. Two minutes after the doctors declared him brain dead, Lacey posted a picture of Garnett on Facebook with the caption, Garnett the Great journeyed onward today at 10.20 a.m. Within two minutes, she was posting it on social media. People felt incredibly sorry for her to the point that they were creating GoFundMe campaigns and raising money for the funeral expenses and anything else that Lacey needed. Chris Hill, Garnett's dad, had heard about what was going on and made numerous attempts to contact Lacey. She eventually responded to him several hours later, asking for his number. She told him she would call, but couldn't write then. He asked her not to shut him out again, but she never responded. The medical examiner determined that all of Garnett's organs were in perfect working condition and reconfirmed that there was no medical explanation for the spike in his sodium. Detectives then decided to pull the Spears family into a conference room and explain the protocol that they had to follow regarding Garnett's death. He explained that they might never know what happened to Garnett given the circumstances, and every detective present noticed the look on her face following that statement. It was a smile, an absolute look of relief. A lot of chaos took place during that meeting, and while detectives were trying to speak with Grandma Peggy, she became visibly upset. This caused a bit of an argument between detectives and the family, and that's when Lacey suddenly spoke up and said, quote, If I mix something up that killed Garnett, it's not my fault. I didn't murder him, which obviously shocked everyone in the room. And everyone shut the fuck up, too. Shortly after, detectives went back to Lacey's apartment with a new search warrant and searched again for the other feeding bag that was left in the trash can, which they were thankfully able to recover. They took both bags back to the Westchester County lab so that they could be tested. They put a rush on the testing, and the results came back within just a few hours. The toxicologist found extremely high levels of salt in the bag's contents, equivalent to five and a half teaspoons of salt. I want to show you what five and a half teaspoons of salt looks like. I've got a cup. Here's an empty bowl. This is a teaspoon. One. Two. Three, four, five. This is the half. Five and a half. That's what five and a half teaspoons of salt looks like in a feeding tube bag. I just want to kind of put that into perspective. That's considered to be 22 servings of sodium. 
The maximum salt intake for an average sized adult is about one teaspoon per day. Consuming this much sodium would be equivalent to eating approximately 69 McDonald's salt packets or 20 hot dogs. A normal child would likely vomit if they consumed this much sodium to purge it from their body. Given Garnett's condition and the procedure that he had undergone, Garnett was unable to do so. Once those lab results came back, the Rampo and Westchester Police Department started to treat Garnett's case as a murder investigation. Lacey was very clearly their only suspect, considering she was the only person that had direct access to Garnett when he became ill each and every time, and was the person who was responsible for his feedings. The fellowship then told her that she was no longer welcome there and would need to move out within seven days, but they actually paid for Lacey and her entire family to stay at the Comfort Inn in Hawthorne. She asked April, the woman who had created the fundraiser for Lacey, to change the name of the campaign from Garnett expenses to just the expenses so that she could use the money to pay her attorney. When the woman refused and refunded everyone their money, Lacey tried to cash out the funds herself and was furious to discover that she no longer had access to it. She then removed her belongings from the fellowship and started planning Garnett's cremation and funeral. By this point, police were keeping tabs on her and eventually took her iPhone, iPad, and laptop. Lacey never once spoke during this exchange, but her sister Rebecca voluntarily handed over her iPad because Lacey had been using it. When the police finally took her devices, she could no longer cope with reality, so she started Googling ways that she could commit suicide including with her mother's insulin and with sleeping pills. However, she never followed through with any of the options that Google provided her. Yet another examination was conducted on Garnett's body before they removed his heart, liver, and spleen for transplantation. Everything was normal. They then conducted an autopsy, which determined that Garnett had absolutely no medical issues with any of his remaining organs. They examined his brain, which showed no signs of any trauma, tumors, or hemorrhages. No issues outside of the swelling that occurred from the rise in sodium. During the autopsy, they also took a look into Garnett's esophagus, stomach, and intestines to check for evidence of the diseases that Lacey had claimed he had, and everything came back normal. They sent off the samples of Garnett's feces to be tested for infection, and everything was normal. Again, once the autopsy was finished, his cause of death was determined to be from hypernatremia, which was caused by feeding sodium from an outside source. It was ruled a homicide. They then requested to have Lacey come back to the hospital and formally identify Garnett's body. She refused so her dad went in her place. While Terry was there identifying his grandson's body, Lacey was busy trying to access the money that people had donated once again. That bothered the two women that organized the fundraiser so much that they actually called the Westchester PD to report the way she was acting about it. The following day, detectives went to the Green Meadow Waldorf School to interview Garnett's teacher. Because she had been a nurse before she was a teacher, she asked them if they had reviewed the video from the EEG machine, and the detectives were kind of shocked because they were unaware that any type of video existed. She explained to them that EEGs have video and audio and that they could contact the hospital to get the footage, which they obviously did. And I'm going to talk more about this video that they recovered in a second. Once Lacey and her family received Garnett's ashes, she made the decision to go back to Kentucky where her parents were living, but remained in contact with the detectives and her attorneys. She then started to communicate with Chris again, who actually felt sorry for her at the time. Lacey actually told people that she thought thought the investigation would soon be closed and that she had plans to move back to Florida and have yet another baby. You know, because priorities. Lacey told Chris that he could come to Garnett's memorial service and talked about what kind of child he was and the interest that he had. She accepted his friend request on Facebook so that he could see pictures of his now deceased son, but told him that he wasn't allowed to share any of them. Likely because she didn't want people to see it and catch on to her lies. She then asked Chris if he wanted to meet up and talk, which honestly Honestly, likely had an ulterior motive behind it. I don't know, maybe she thought that she could trick him into getting her pregnant again since she now needed a replacement for Garnett. And I'd like to add that Chris did not attend the memorial service because Lacey never told him where or when it was. Chris still defended her to the media when they contacted him and he told them that there was absolutely no reason to be investigating Lacey because he knew she loved him. She also continued to try and access money from the fundraiser and when April told her that she closed the account and 
and refunded everyone because they didn't know what was going on, Lacey unfriended both of the women on social media and never spoke with either of them again. But don't worry, because her continued posts, where she practically begged for sympathy and attention, managed to suck her in more people, who launched a new fundraiser for her. She continued to post almost daily, or sometimes multiple times a day, clear up to her arrest about Garnett and how all of this was affecting her. She made a furious rant a few weeks after Garnett died because she had received a letter stating that she would no longer be receiving Garnett's disability check every month. She wrote that it, quote, broke her more than she already was. I bet it did. Meanwhile, she was going for long, leisurely jogs through the woods and had already gotten a new puppy named Remington, and she was on her way to starting a new life. Detectives finally received the video footage from Garnett's hospital room and were shocked by what they saw. On January 19, 2014, you can see that Garnett's condition had improved. He was back to acting like his normal self until Lacey picked him up and told him to go into the bathroom at approximately 10.25 a.m. She can be seen carrying a feeding tube and a cup into the bathroom with her. And when they emerged, it only took about a minute before Garnett became violently ill and was trying to dry heave. And you could also see Lacey waiting to press the call button. All right, so detectives continued combing through all of the evidence and weeding their way through Lacey's lies for the next four months. In mid-June of 2014, Lacey, at the advice of her attorney, flew to New York with her dad. By this point, police were planning to make an arrest and her attorneys knew it would be better for her to be in New York rather than her being extradited. Lacey was indicted for second degree murder as well as first degree manslaughter for the death of Garnett. And she was facing a maximum sentence of 25 years to life. An arrest warrant was issued and Lacey surrendered that afternoon. She was then booked into the county jail. Afterwards, she was arraigned, at which time she pled not guilty to both charges. And the judge decided that she wouldn't have the option to bail out until her following court date, which was about two weeks later on July 2nd. Because Garnett's case had received so much media attention, her arraignment was actually televised nationally, and Christine O'Brien, Lacey's former roommate at the Fellowship, the one that had accused her of stealing things, watched this arraignment, and literally saw Lacey wearing a sweater that she had stolen from her on TV. So she clearly had no shame whatsoever. Lacey was then put on suicide watch back at the jail and was not allowed to have any blankets, sheets, or shoelaces. On July 7th, People Magazine published an article about Lacey and Garnett, and I believe they were the first to mention that Lacey could potentially be suffering from Munchausen by proxy, which she still adamantly denies to this day, despite many experts maintaining that she is a textbook case. But it was highly unusual for Lacey to actually kill Garnett, because what feeds a person that has Munchausen is the attention and sympathy that it brings to them. They want their children to suffer enough that they can get special treatment and come across as just a saint. Oh, bless her heart to other people, but not enough that they actually die. Because if they die, they no longer have the opportunity to get that attention or sympathy. Prior to the trial, it was unclear whether Lacey's attorneys planned to use a psychiatric attempt, but as more things started to come out about the case, it seemed that this would be their best bet. Media outlets started to report that Garnett had suffered at the hands of his mother his entire life, as well as the fact that he suffered from hypernatremia at two separate times in his life, both of which raised suspicions. It was also exposed that the many reports made to CPS, as well as reports from doctors who believed that Lacey was suffering from postpartum depression, as well as Munchausen by proxy, yet no action was taken. I 100% believe that she intentionally got pregnant so that she would have a child around to torture full time, so that she wouldn't be inconvenienced when parents decided to take their kids away from her. Aside from Garnett, she used every single person she came in contact with. She knew how to manipulate people to get what she wanted, and she knew how to draw attention to herself. Aside from the horrible things that she did to Garnett, from the time he was two days old, he was also failed many times by many people, including Doc 
doctors, social workers, Lacey's family, her friends, anyone who came in contact with them that noticed something. The fellowship failed Garnett. And I know if someone from the fellowship watches this, they're going to disagree with me, but they should have been held accountable as well. Because Christine, Lacey's roommate, literally reported that she believed Garnett was being abused to the executive circle and they didn't do shit. There were so many red flags and so many reports made, yet nobody did a goddamn thing. This was senseless. And I can't imagine how that little boy must have felt or how scared he was of his own mother. And that makes me sick. She also stripped the world of the greatness that Garnett would become. And I have absolutely no sympathy for the bullying or mistreatment that she's receiving while she's in prison. I do think that it's likely she should have been diagnosed with Munchausen by proxy, but I literally hate when people use the term suffering to go along with that. Because the only person that suffered in this case was Garnett. And the only people that are suffering now are the ones that truly loved him and the people that miss him still to this day. I don't think that she gives a shit that her kid's dead, and I hope she serves life in prison. Even though I'm pretty sure that's not likely because she's probably the best inmate and she'll get out when her parole date comes on good behavior. Hopefully she's never able to conceive a kid again. But that's all I got for you today guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video. As always, remember the name Casey Shane. I'm out.